<laughs> I remember it was a friend of mine. Yeah. 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 Long Isle. And people are in two of that. So you order them to the Eagles. And you can take it over there. And you can go to the dogs. Yeah, no, you can let me know. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Trevor Jones, and I chair the trustees of the Posbury St. Francis Trust. And on behalf of the trustees, I do welcome you here to this, our first inaugural. Uh, Posbury St Francis Trust lecture, which we are determined will be an annual event. And we're very happy that we're doing this in partnership with the university, with EXCEPT, which I have to read it, is the Extra Centre for Ethics and Practical Theology. And we're very grateful to the university um, for hosting us and for all the assistance and, and help that we have been given. So a warm welcome. Quite a number of people also will be watching online. Um, so um, welcome to them too. Just to say the trust was formed in 2021 from the sale of properties uh, at Posbury near Crediton. And since 1942 until 2018, uh, those properties were occupied by an Anglican community known as the Franciscan Servants of Jesus and Mary. It was a women's uh, religious order. And they had as their objects mission, evangelism and spirituality. And those same objects are part of our trust. Interestingly, uh, Mother Teresa, is it Mother Teresa or Sister Teresa? Mother Teresa, um, the founder was a very interesting lady and had a number of uh, interests herself. And Bridget Gillard, who is one of our trustees, is researching and writing a book on uh, Sister Ter uh, Mother Teresa and uh, the subsequent order and her themes. And we will be picking up those themes in this annual lecture, one of which we have uh, tonight. Um, we're delighted to welcome Chris as our lecturer, and uh, Susanna will be introducing him in a moment. But I just asked Bridget to say a little bit uh, about Mother Teresa and perhaps about your book. <laughs> when Mother Teresa formed the Franciscan Servants of Jesus and Mary, the FSJM, in 1926, she was determined to create a different type of religious order who lived not within a convent, but part of the community frequently encountering opposition from those whose views differed from her own. Undeterred, she remained true to her vision, moving her nascent community from Cornwall to the poorest part of Paisley in Scotland, the slums of the City Road in London, and then the Isle of Wight, before finally settling in Devon in 1942. The strength of her personality and vision attracted a number of women to join in her difficult life of poverty, religious observance, and social work. These unusual women who did not conform to either the religious or social mores of the time were met with equal measures of appreciation and suspicion wherever they went. Throughout her life, Mother Teresa embraced a number of causes to which she remained committed and which informed the work of the FSJM. These included pacifism, the campaign for nuclear disarmament, the anti-apartheid movement, environmentalism, which she then used to refer to as ecology, prisoner rehabilitation, anti-materialism, and the need for social justice. She wrote in 1958, poor sorrowful children of this confused and fear-stricken age, as they appear in the courts of our land and all the other countries, full of such a pathetic toughness and cynicism, it is, only they who, it is not only they who stand accused and judged, 
but also in a very terrible way, they are our accusers and we are judged in them. Many of her views and writings were extraordinar extraordinarily prescient and it is therefore fitting that part of the legacy of her community can now be used to continue to explore these issues, many of which are so alive today. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you. Susanna. Hello, everybody. I, I think it's very good for a lecturer's or, a, um, or an introducer's uh, humility to have to look up. Uh, I, think it's satisfying. I hope you'll find the same. Um, I think I know most people in the room, but for anyone who I don't know or for people that are joining online, uh, I'm Susanna Cornwall. I'm the director of EXCEPT, the Exeter Centre for Ethics and Practical Theology and Professor of Constructive Theologies here at Exeter. Before I introduce Chris in a moment, I just wanted to say a little bit about EXCEPT for anybody who, who doesn't know what it is and, and how it began and so on. Um, so, EXCEPT originally launched uh, as the Centre for the Study of the Learning Church, supported by a grant from the St Luke's College Foundation. That was back in 2009. Um, under Professor Siobhan Garrigan, who was our former colleague here, it was then relaunched as the Exeter Centre for Ecumenical and Practical Theology. When she left Exeter in 2014, uh, I became the director. And we renamed the centre to reflect the research expertise in the then Department of Theology and Religion. And except now continues as a research centre within our new department of classics, ancient history, religion and theology. I'm just putting up a few pictures on the slides because it's always nice when people can spot themselves. Um, we've had various kind of events and activities over the years, um, including public lectures, workshops, research symposia, um, on topics uh, including anti-racism, uh, decolonizing theological education, uh, queering religious sexual scripts in South Africa, uh, contextual Bible study, intersex and trans people and their spiritual well-being, uh, religion and law, um, and lots, lots more. We've hosted mentoring and networking activity for academics, activists and practitioners, a photographic exhibition, uh, the European premiere of a major documentary um, and more. But we're really, really thrilled by this latest initiative and so grateful to have the support of the Posbury St Francis Trust and have several trustees here with us this evening for this new lecture series on theology and social justice. Our inaugural lecturer is Dr Chris Shanahan, who is Associate Professor in Political Theology at the Center for Trust, Peace and Social Relations at Coventry University. Before he joined Coventry in 2015, Chris was variously head of RE at a large East London secondary school, a youth worker both in East London and in Jamaica, a Methodist minister in inner city London and Birmingham, lecturer in religions and theology at the University of Manchester, where we briefly overlapped, although you were coming as I was going, so it was brief, um, and a community organiser. And this real wealth of experience uh, informs the grounding for his research in urban theology, sociology of religion and diversity studies. He was principal investigator on a major three year project, which we're going to hear lots more about this evening, called Life on the Breadline, Christianity, politics, and poverty in the 21st century city. In this project, he and his co-researchers analyzed the nature, scope, and impact of Christian engagement with urban poverty in the UK since the 2008 financial crash. I don't want to steal your thunder, so I won't say too much more about that. Um, his first monograph, which was published in 2010, Voices from the Borderland, was described as a groundbreaking example of cross-cultural urban theology. His second monograph, A Theology of Community Organizing from 2014, provided the first systematic theological analysis of broad-based community organizing. And at the moment, I believe you're working on a book coming out of the project that we're going to hear about this evening. That's right. Great. Um, so we're absolutely thrilled to welcome Chris as our inaugural Posbury St. Francis lecturer. Please do join me in welcoming him. There you go. These are all the pictures that I couldn't show you because it wasn't working a minute ago. But here they are. We'll just skip through them. Uh, and then it meant that you didn't have to have your face on the screen while I was talking about you, which bless you for everybody. And there you go. And it's working. Thanks, Perfect. Thank you, Susanna, and thank you, Moena. Where's she gone? 
There we are. Thank you, Moena, for, for the kind invitation and for making sure I found my way from train station to hotel and here to meet with you all. It's a real joy to be with you this evening. And thank you to the Trust and to colleagues within the University of Exeter Theology and Religion Department, particularly within Accept, for asking me to come and share some thoughts with you this evening. I'm going to speak for about 40 or 45 minutes, and if I speak any longer, if you've got anything heavy, by all means throw it in my direction, but warn me first, <laughs> don't be polite, just tell me to shut up, please. Um, and then hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for conversation and questions. Welcome also to those who are joining us online. I spoke in The Wheel of Injustice, the violence of poverty, and the calling of the church in an age of austerity. 14.4 million people live in poverty in the UK in 2023. The Trussell Trust, which handed out 25,000 three-day food parcels in the year of the financial crash, 2008, last 12 months has handed out close to 3 million. 4 million children face holiday hunger, 280,000 people are officially homeless, a 75% increase since 2010. 1.5 million people are destitute, 1.2 million on zero hours contracts, and more than 11 million people regularly experience food insecurity. That's life in Breadline Britain in 2023. But as the writer of Proverbs reminds us, those who oppress the poor insult their maker. Those who oppress the poor insult their maker. I want us to reflect on five things this evening together. Firstly, to say a word or two about the nature and the complexity of poverty. Secondly, to speak briefly about the research project that Susanna spoke of a few moments ago, Life on the Breadline. And it's great to see Grace with us this evening. Grace was a, um, an advisor earlier on in the development of the project. So it's nice to see you with us this evening. I want to then, coming out of our work in Life on the Red Line, to speak about a number of different Christian responses to austerity age poverty that we identified. Then to speak very briefly, to just sow some seeds, as it were, about what we might call an austerity age theology of liberation, just to begin touching some of those touchstones and to close by identifying what we would suggest are five challenges facing the church as it seeks to respond to its calling and to respond to austerity age poverty. But step one for any honest theologian needs to be a word of confession. Because the truth of the matter is that whilst theologians within the church and within the academy have spoken and written and preached about poverty and inequality since time immemorial, fast forward to the UK financial crash of 2008 and the resulting age of austerity, go to your local library and look for books written by theologians about austerity and you will look for a very long time because there are virtually no academic articles or books written by theologians about poverty and the church in the UK since the financial crash of 2008. We need to be humble enough, it seems to me, within theology, within the church and the academy to learn from our social science colleagues. You can't move for articles and books and projects and reports, particularly from social geographers about austerity and the rise of poverty and the rise of inequality and the growing significance of the church and other faith communities in responding. Theology needs to face what I would call is its Kairos moment. This is a moment of challenge and judgment but also opportunity for theology to stop talking the talk and start walking the walk. 
let's catch up. And also, let's ask ourselves some difficult questions. One of the things that we encountered in life on the breadline, in a nutshell, would be a caring but often disengaged church that was caring and serious in its commitment to social justice, but was often, not always, but often largely cushioned from the visceral realities of austerity age poverty. So theology faces its Kairos moment. That Kairos moment is what we might refer to as the age of austerity. Are we, as former Chancellor of the Exchequer George Osborne claimed again and again, like his boss David Cameron, that we are all in this together? that we all need to sacrifice in order to balance the nation's books, the claims that they made before and just after the 2010 general election when crash had become global recession. Their claim was that Britain was, quote, broken, that the only response to the mess that they claimed Gordon Brown was responsible for, the economic necessity was for a period of austerity, a period of deep self-restraint and deep cuts to, quote, balance the nation's books. But there's a question. And the question has been answered in recent years by a succession of government ministers. Was the claim that austerity, those 25% cuts in welfare spending, the bedroom tax, the disastrous rollout of universal credit, was all of that the freeze in benefits? Was that really an economic necessity or was it an ideologically motivated political choice. Our claim, our suggestion, having engaged with these kind of reflections and these experiences during life on the breadline, is that austerity was a political choice. It was not an economic necessity because other major countries decided to respond to the same economic challenges by investing rather than cutting and cutting and cutting again. But have we all got to sacrifice? Well, if we have, then that sounds fair enough. Maybe David Cameron was right. Truth of the matter is, though, that we've not all been in this together. Some of us have been hit far harder by austerity than others. If you look and sound like me, often you've done okay. But women, Generally speaking, single parents, black and brown Britons, younger people, people from cities in the Northwest, the Northeast and the West Midlands have been hit far harder in statistical terms than other groups by austerity. We clearly are not all in this together, but we are living through what's now being called euphemistically a cost of living crisis. I would question whether this is an unexpected crisis or the price that we pay for a decade of austerity. So in light of that, let me say three things about poverty before talking briefly about our Life on the Breadline project and different Christian responses, because I think it's important that we root our work in relation to the work of the church in an understanding of the nature of poverty. Because too often, whether it's politicians or preachers or researchers, poverty is reduced to food poverty and food banks and nothing more. However vital and important that is, it's a small piece of the picture. And I think if we think for a moment or two about an octopus, that might help us. 1964, Martin Luther King, when receiving the Nobel Peace Prize, stood up to speak and said that poverty was like a monstrous octopus 
whose prehensile tentacles reached in every into every corner of our lives. Poverty reached everywhere and was multiple in its the damage that it did to us. It couldn't be pinned down, it couldn't be reduced because it was so complex. And yet we try to simplify poverty, but we will not get to grips with it as church or as theologians if we don't recognize that poverty is multidimensional. And so to the jigsaw, one of the things that we did during the project was to work with an artist called Beth Waters and Beth created this jigsaw for us to try and suggest that if we're going to understand austerity age poverty, contemporary poverty, we need to recognize the interconnectedness as Gustavo Gutierrez did half a century ago, the interconnection of food poverty and fuel poverty and low pay and poor housing and zero hours contracts and insecure employment. For example, let's, let's imagine I come to your food bank and you give me, you give me that package to take home with me. It's generous and I appreciate it, but I'm too embarrassed to tell you that I can't cook it because I haven't got any money left on the meter. Fuel poverty and food poverty and poor housing and the fact that I've been waiting six weeks for my universal credit to come through all coalesce, it seems to me, in a perfect storm. This is one of the things that we needed to get to grips with within life on the breadline. And Gutierrez, as I say, said it half a century ago. Poverty, he suggested, is lack of food and housing, the inability to attend to health and educational needs, the exploitation of workers, permanent unemployment, lack of respect for one's human dignity. So poverty is multidimensional. Secondly, poverty is systemic. Way back in 1981, I think it was 81 or 82, Norman Tebbit stood up at the Conservative Party conference and told the story of his father, who had been unemployed during the Great Depression of the 1930s. Norman Tebbit su suggested that his father didn't moan and wag his finger at the government, but he got on his bike and he cycled and cycled until he found work. He was what Keir Starmer and Rishi Sunak might call one of a hard-working family, in inverted commas. He was what we might refer to as the deserving poor, rather than the undeserving poor that George Osborne spoke of in 2012, the head of the Welfare Reform Act, when he started to speak about shirkers and workers, strivers and strivers, individualizing poverty, blaming individual people who are living in poverty for being poor, and implicitly, and maybe not so implicitly, tapping into that narrative that went all the way back to the Elizabethan poor laws, the idle poor, the skybers, the strivers, Norman Tibbet's dad on his bike. But we know it's a nonsense. We know it's a myth, but it's a myth that too many within the churches we discovered still half believe. If I'm poor, really, I need to roll my sleeves up. I need to work a bit harder. It's because I've got poor role models. I need to work harder still. But again, Gutierrez half a century ago reminds us of the nonsense of the individualizing of poverty that leads us to blame ourselves and shame ourselves and internalize the stigma that we see on the front page of a whole bunch of newspapers. Gutierrez speaks of poverty as a form of, po of systemic sin, quotes, present in the structures of oppression created for the benefit of the few. 
So I would argue, I would suggest that poverty is no accident. Poverty is not about whether I work hard and you don't. Poverty is built into the system. Poverty and inequality are systemic aspects of the capitalist system that we live within. And yet the church, starting with the Anglican communion in the 1980s, commits itself in those marks of mission to seek to, quote, transform structural injustice, a modern telling of the preferential option for the poor. The question is, do we mean it when we say it? Do we walk the walk or are we just content to talk the talk? So poverty is multidimensional. It's systemic. It's also violence, I would suggest. Poverty is a form of multidimensional, traumatizing violence. Elsa Tamez, the Mexican biblical scholar, suggested that in the Bible, poverty represents the degradation of the human being, a seizure of the divine image in the person. Mahatma Gandhi referred to poverty as the worst form of violence. I've, what I've suggested on the screen, in the kind of little four, four boxes there, are some of the forms of violence that we saw within our life on the Breadline project. The trauma of the slow, bureaucratic, vicious violence that led to the deaths of the 72 in the Grenfell Tower tragedy. The direct and structural violence of homelessness and poor housing. The bureaucratic violence of universal credit. The existential violence of being told again and again and again that you're a lazy, good for nothing. You live in a rubbish area, in a rubbish estate, and it's all your fault that you're poor. I believe it. If someone tells me I'm rubbish enough, if someone tells me it's my fault that I can't get a job, it's my fault, eventually I'm going to begin to believe or at least question how much I'm worth. So poverty is a form of violence, a deeply damaging, corrosive form of traumatising violence. I think too often we domesticate our understanding of poverty, but it's multidimensional, it's systemic, and it's violent. So that was the backdrop for life on the breadline, and we wanted to dig down deep. Our research team was made up of myself as a political theologian, Peter Scott, who Susanna and I both know well, theologian from Manchester, Robert Beckford, pioneer of black theology in the UK, and a social geography colleague, Stephanie Denning, who joined the team. That's where we began. And Life on the Breadline, which ran from 2018 to 21, so we're now in the kind of so-called dissemination and impact phase to get all jargony about it, was going back to what I said earlier about theology needing to kind of beat its breast a bit. At the time, and I believe it's still the case, Life on the Breadline was the first major empirically-based academic theology project to analyze Christian responses to poverty during the age of austerity. There have been articles written, there have been projects, but Life on the Breadline, I think it's fair to say, remains the largest database, as it were, of academic theological research into contemporary poverty. Whilst I've been speaking, you'll have seen on the screen some of the things that we did. So we combined interviews with practitioners, with six case studies, three, two in Birmingham, two in Manchester, and two in London, focusing on different Christian traditions and different aspects of poverty. We can say more about that a little later if there's time. We interviewed 16 national church leaders, I think if we had a quiz at the beginning of Life on the Breadline and I was asked, how many Christian denominations are there in Britain? 
I wouldn't have come up with that many. But we managed to interview church leaders from 16 Christian denominations across the UK and survey church leaders, regional church leaders, well, different denominations define region in different ways. And I think one of the one of the current times I put my foot in it most was when I was um, making mistakes about the way that different Christian denominations define dioceses and districts and regions. But you you get the picture. We decided to work with images and a series of focus groups fo uh, focusing on photographs and developed a national poverty consultation. So that was the base for our conversations with approximately 800 people. So what did we discover? Well, I want to talk about each of these responses briefly in a moment or two. But what we encountered were four broad, let me emphasize the word broad, and fluid responses, Christian responses to poverty. These are not fixed or pinned down in concrete ideal types. And the reason I'm stressing that is that we've been taken to task before for creating this apparently fixed diagram and claiming that life is very fixed and formal, and we know it's not. However, these four approaches, these broad approaches, caring, campaigning and advocacy, self-help and community building, do, I would suggest, reflect, in broad terms, differing ethical, missiological, ecclesiological and theological traditions, as well as differing relationships between different Christian denominations and the state. So there is a breadth there, I think, that is pragmatic and theological. So let's talk about each of these briefly and then say a word or two about some of the challenges that arise from, from these for theology and for the church before drawing to a close. Firstly, caring. The caring response is the response that governments, whether they be of the left or the right, like best, because it doesn't frighten the horses too much. Caring responses are shaped by that servant ethic, that Matthew 25 ethic. When you feed the hungry, you feed me. When you clothe the naked, you clothe me. When you welcome the stranger, you welcome me. It's an image that's rooted in servanthood the notion of the church as a servant community. And it has immense value that must not be minimized. We see it focusing on pastoral care, a real strong emphasis on doing whatever is needed to help people flourish, and a strong focus on an ethical commitment to the importance of the common good. We see it in food banks and breakfast clubs and warm clubs, and you can probably, warm banks, and you can probably add to that list. Its focus is largely on welfare rather than social justice as an approach. Of course, there are crossovers. We see in the work, for example, of the Trussell Trust, a crossover between the church as caring and the church as campaigning, the church as advocate. But that caring tradition remains and remains the dominant one within the responses that we receive from church leaders across the theological and ecclesiological spectrum. A strong focus on church leaders for, on notions of Jesus standing in solidarity with those who are oppressed, on the notion of God having a preferential option for the poor, on the importance of the church being called to transform structural injustice. But we don't get involved in politics, dot, 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 dot. I'm being a bit facetious, but that, that challenge, that tension remains and came up again and again and again in interviews. But this second tradition, the campaigning and advocacy tradition, 
is one that doesn't perhaps just see the church as a servant movement, but more as a liberative movement. This is a tradition that is almost as ancient as the church. We see it in the Hebrew prophets, in Jeremiah, we see it in Jesus' own articulation of his mission in Luke 14, to preach good news to the poor and release to the captives. We see it in the work of the early Franciscans. We see it in the work of countless religious movements throughout history, the Christian socialists, the work of priests, the emergence of liberation theology in Latin America. Richard Fraser from the Church of Scotland argues that this needs to be the response of the church because Jesus, quotes had a bias to the poor. That was what he suggested to us in interview. Liam Purcell from Church Action on Poverty suggested that we need to talk we need to talk about the root causes of poverty. It's not enough to do local social action. So this is a form of response to poverty that moves beyond caring, moves beyond welfare, to focus explicitly and prophetically on the calling of the church to stand for social justice. The Archbishop of Wales, the most senior Anglican leader in the Anglican Church in Wales, suggested that church has a duty to speak up on behalf of people who are unjustly treated. There's a but, and that but is implied in that last little question. And it's a question that troubled me because it was raised by leaders from smaller denominations that spoke to us. The Free Church of Scotland, the Church of the Cherubim and Seraphim, and the Wesleyan Reformed Church. A number of smaller churches said, it's okay for the Pope or the Archbishop of Canterbury to call us to march on Downing Street. It's okay for Anglican bishops to stand up in the church in, in the House of Lords and wag their finger at the Prime Minister. But who's going to listen to me? Who's going to listen to us? We're too small, we're too weak, we're too marginalised, and the Methodist chair of the Manchester and Stockport district suggested that the government doesn't want to listen anyway. So there is a question mark at the very least about this notion of whether advocacy is a tool for all of us or just some of us. So caring, campaigning, briefly self-help and enterprise. He had a very different, much more individualistic approach to responding to poverty that isn't one that I would necessarily instinctively put on the slide, but it was there. It was part of our research and it's particularly strong amongst evangelical and Pentecostal churches. Think, for example, of the, the importance that Saturday schools have had within many inner city Pentecostal churches path, uh, using education as a pathway to social mobility and a pathway out of poverty. This approach here, the self-help approach, places an emphasis on enterprise. The church here is an enabler, in some cases providing loans so that people can establish small businesses or social enterprises to work their own way out of poverty. There are, there's a whole long, longer conversation about the prosperity gospel, but there is a temptation, it seems to me, buried within this notion of the church as empowerer and the church giving me money to enable me to work my way out of poverty. There is a tendency here to kind of forget folks around about me. This is a, an effective means of reaching a number of people who have been living in poverty but it's very individualized. I'm okay, but those structures of injustice remain intact. Again, we can come back to that if we want to. And then on to one of our other case studies, Hodge Hill Church in East Birmingham. Here, the fourth approach, we think of the church, churches as a community builder. Firstly, we have the caring, the church as a servant community. Secondly, the campaigning and the advocacy. 
church as a liberative movement. Thirdly, self-help and enterprise, the church as an enabler. Finally, community building, the church as a fellow traveler. Rooted in very committed and deep notions of incarnational spirituality, the notion of God being with us in the, in the mess of life. This bottom-up approach to community building, which is rooted in an approach to community work, referred to as asset-based community development, A, B, C, D, to use the jargon. This approach to the church standing with people in poverty avoids, according to a friend of um, Susanna and I, Al Barrett, who's the vicar in Hodge Hill, avoids the so-called rescuer language of outside outsiders, whether they be politicians or preachers, parachuting in and saving the community before legging it out to write their best-selling books. For Al, and for ABCD, that's not, not good enough because there needs to be a long-term commitment. If we're serious about incarnation and the notion of God with us in the mess, that means that we need an ecclesiology of solidarity, suggests this approach. An approach that challenges the poverty of relationships and the poverty of identity and the stigma and and shame that can sometimes be thrown at communities and low self-esteem. The challenge though for ABCD is the challenge of its response to structural injustice. Building community is vital, but is there the political edge within the ABCD approach to challenge the structures of injustice? That's a question that I'm still thinking about. And um, if you've got any answers, please let me know. So we live, I would suggest, at a Kairos moment within the church, reaching back to that great martyr of the German church, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Is the church called to bandage up the wounds of the victims beneath the wheels of injustice or to drive a spoke into the wheel of injustice itself? It's probably fairly obvious that I think whilst bandages are really important, our job within the church, our job, and I speak about myself as theologians, is to think about ways in which we can ram that spoke into the wheel of injustice. Austerity, I would argue, is liberation theology's new project. And as promised before, we close with the challenges to the church, here are just one or two seeds of what I think needs to be part of an austerity age theology of liberation. It needs to be deeply, deeply contextual, rooted in local communities and the experience of poverty. It needs to be genuinely interdisciplinary. There is a kind of a fashion within theology of talking about being interdisciplinary, talking about ethnography particularly, usually in the introduction of a book, and I've been a bit facetious to make the point, but then kind of slowly, gradually reverting to type and forgetting all this social science nonsense when we get down to the real stuff. I'm being facetious because I think that's a, that's, that's a cop-out. We need to be seriously interdisciplinary in our work. And I'm not alone in saying that, of course. We need to recognize that our theology needs to be apocalyptic. And I say that, I think using the word deliberately, we need to recognize the need to unmask, to make visible what has been made invisible, to unmask the cultural violence that normalizes poverty and injustice and enables people like Norman Tebbit to say all you need is a bike and the determination to get a job. We need an egalitarian understanding of humanity and incarnational ecclesiology, a very strong focus, it seems to me, on 
the notion of liberty reversals and a strong and prophetic and public commitment to God's preferential option for the poor, not because all of the rich folks that we know are somehow wicked sinners and every poor person in Britain is a saint, but because, as we know, the structural injustice that leads to 2.9 million three-day food parcels from the Trust of Trust contradicts the nature and the will of a loving God who creates us all of equal worth in the divine image. And all of that, I would suggest, raises, in closing, five challenges to the church to assert a clear vision of God's preferential option for the poor, to overcome its engagement from the daily realities, disengagement from the daily realities of austerity, to use its social capital, its presence, to, su to support sustained prophetic campaigning for structural change, to make defeating poverty central to all church policies and not just the kind of stuff that red reverends or people like me are into. It's at the heart of the church. And to recognise the power of liturgy and worship, to use our liturgy and worship in small groups to challenge the cultural violence that underpins poverty. Those who oppress the poor insult their maker. These are some of the things that we've been making in response to the work that we've done in Life on the Breadline. You can find out more about the project on the website. But for now, I just wanted to say thank you for your invitation. And I hope some of these reflections have been useful and helpful. Thank you very much. So I very much hope that we can have the time of conversation. Thank you very much um, indeed, Chris. Um, I invite uh, questions um, from the floor. Perhaps we might just take um, a minute to let those questions um, roll around our heads and we perhaps talk to your next door neighbour or if you can, you want to lean forward over the seat and sit in the seat in front. Um, and then we'll, if Chris is happy, we'll take um, some questions. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's interesting, actually. Yeah. 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 I don't think I'd have been as much into the kind of if I'd remained until it and I'm about 70 or 80 people in the sense it's a large, large grouping. 
When I back in 2017, Thankfully, I would draw. Right, can I invite you then to um, pose your questions to our children? You know those films where you see that kind of tumbleweed? Like, <laughs> you go. We've got a question online, so can we take that first? Oh, yeah, fine. There's a chat behind you. Yeah. Okay. okay, cool. So it's a question from Diana Waters online who says, How do we challenge the fear of being too political within the inherited church? The inherited church being. Uh, okay. Diana, do, do you mean the. Uh, she probably can't hear me, but oh, I'll ask her and she can um, elaborate if you want. D Diana, when you say the inherited church, can you just give me a clue about what you mean? I think I might know, but I don't want to misunderstand you. <laughs> I'll just ramble on and then you can type something and then Susanna can shout at me if I'm going down the wrong road. Um, one of the things that was said to us time and time again, and I hope this is an answer to her question, is that, is that the vast majority of churches were, were shaped by this ethical commitment to, to service and to caring and to welfare in the proper sense of that word. Um, and, and saw it very much as a form of pastoral care and a, a kind of response to Jesus' command to love our neighbour. Um, and if people pushed it further, they would say, this is my way of living out what Jesus says we should do in Matthew 25. So all of that said, I think what we met again and again in local communities and in amongst church leaders was the sense that the church, by and large, with some exceptions, has been cushioned from the kind of the raw realities, the brutal realities of austerity. And if you're slightly disengaged, if you're slight, slightly cushioned, Potentially, it's it's easier to be less angry. It's easier to be less fist shaking. I don't know that that's a great answer, but I think there is again this notion of perhaps more sim simply this kind of notion of the old divi so called divide between religion and politics. The idea that the church shouldn't be involved in in, in politics. That it's too risky, it's too partisan, but caring for everybody and putting a blanket around folk, nobody's going to argue with. Um, I think Diana's interested specifically in the church leaders as the established church, she's clarified. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I think a lot of what I, said, what I said I would still say, I think on the basis of what we encountered in, in Life on the Breadline. It was actually not Anglican church leaders that I would make that claim, not accusation, that's not fair. That, I wouldn't say that about Anglican church leaders, by and large, within the project. Um, they might have been, some, some. we spoke to some of the bishops in the House of Lords, and they were very clear about their role as advocates and speaking truth to power. You could argue that if you're part of the establishment, it's far easier to wag your finger and talk about speaking truth to power than it is if you are the leader of a small Nigerian church that is largely rooted in West London and the West Midlands, and you feel alienated already. Um, but what we did find actually was that there was another, another kind of cause for that, that we found more amongst Pentecostal churches than Church of England, Methodist, Baptist, whatever it might be, which was much more of a theological separation between 
religion and politics, the notion of be, being prepared for heaven and not being citizens of this world. I'll stop because otherwise I'll just kind of keep going. There was a. Go oh, sorry, Logan and then Claire. Um, thank you for all that. Um, really um, uh, amazing lecture. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering if there's. Um, so, what kind of strictures need to be put in place, or what kind of things do like church institutions need to be aware of to avoid um, perpetuating systems of poverty in their attempts to alleviate them? Um, so, I think of that. Yeah. One example is that book by Corbett and Picker called When Helping Hurts. I'm not sure if you have opinions on that book or if you think it's bad or good or if you know it. Um, but like ways in which like, um, the, like you said, like you mentioned the kind of like savior complex thing, like I feel like can, can introduce systems of dependency that actually perpetuate mm -hmm. poverty. Um, I think it's very easy for like church institutions to like not be, to like have a good intention, but actually end up like creating systems of systems that actually like might create uh in, in, like create alleviate things temporarily but actually then like create systems that actually don't help in the long run what what kind i mean is this is maybe like you're kind of like multi-varied interdisciplinary approach a way of like maybe avoiding that or are there other other kinds of ways that maybe institutions can be really kind of aware upfront about you know how not to engage in that kind of way to perpetuate those kinds of systems inadvertently yeah. So that's really long. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I'll, I'll kind of respond to the bits that yeah, I yeah. remember. Um, <laughs> uh, what, what, one or two random thoughts, and, and, and pick me up yeah, if yeah. I'm not, not getting you right, please. Um, I think we need to hold our hands up and 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 own the fact that historically, the church has had a mixed record. Let's put it that way in relation to systems of injustice and oppression and poverty and inequality. The church has not been on the side of the oppressed and the poor and the dispossessed since day one. We need to recognize that poverty has been blessed. Inequality has been blessed. Not just today with tele-evangelists pumping out prosperity gospel preaching, but back through the Victorian period, blessing inequality, there was a, a hymn that, um, that I, I guess everybody in the room that's ever been near a church has probably sung, called All Things Bright and Beautiful. That's the one. There's a verse, thank God that we no longer sing, but it was in the original. The rich man in his castle, the poor man in his gate, God made them high and lowly and ordered their estates. Wow. Exactly. Thank goodness for editors. <laughs> but I, I don't point my finger at the hymn writer. Another time, another place, I get that. But it's just an illustration of the fact that I think even within our worship, we've not always been on the right side. Of history, so I think we need to be. There needs to be a, a genuine repentance on the part of the church in that sense, and I'm talking in general terms, which is dangerous. I, I realize that because there are as many exceptions as there are generalizations. And um, I think the second thing I would say is that perhaps almost inevitably, as as social movements, whether they be religious move, social movements or secular social movements, gather steam, gather momentum, become more successful, become bigger, become stronger, become more successful, the bigger you become, the more solid you become, the more property you've got, the easier it is to put up the walls and protect what you have. And I say that quite seriously because i think there is a problem with movements losing their dynamism as they become more conservative small c institutions so maybe we need to listen perhaps and we leave it at this for now we could maybe talk a bit more later if you want and um, one of the great 
sense, I think, of the Anglican Church in the 20th century was Kenneth Leach. Mm. Kenneth Leach spoke about the, what he thought was the calling of the church. And he suggested that the church was called to become an agitating minority within society. I think we've still got a problem of thinking we can do it all. A problem of kind of a sense of entitlement and power. If we are big, if we are rich, if we are wealthy, if we are powerful, we need to kind of we need to repent of that, and it seems to me we need to take some of the teaching of Jesus far more seriously about living in solidarity with those who are genuinely living in poverty. I'm beginning to ramble now. But... Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. I have about a gillion different hairs really around me. <laughs> at least three questions. Um, mm. uh, so, yeah, voice. Um, you spoke about the leaders of the main churches having a voice in the smaller denominations complaining that they didn't. That was their perception, certainly, yeah. Yeah, I would go further and ask, well, what about the voice of the voices of the poor people themselves? Oh, yeah. Um, because, you know, even the leaders of the smaller denominations are still pretty powerful. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Um, yeah, there's this thing, the poor is a label yeah. um, and dehumanizes mm. the uh, people who are poor. Um, so how can the church give poor people a megaphone and get their stories heard and get them into the corridors of power? Two or three very quick responses, each of which could be longer. One, it strikes me, I touched on asset-based community development. I think that is not perfect by any means. I've got question marks over genuinely how well placed it is to move beyond community building to challenging structural injustice. But I think that that approach to long-term ecclesiologies of solidarity that challenge the stigmatizing of people living in poverty. Um, I think that's one. I think the second, which is maybe there's an overlap, um, and maybe it touches as well on the sense of powerlessness on the part of smaller churches, and maybe on that point that, that Logan was making a moment or two ago about what the churches can do. And that's the, that's the role of community organising, broad-based community organising as a model of politics. In the UK, we've got this network referred to as Citizens UK. starts in London, you see it in Manchester, Birmingham, a number of cities now. Um, it's not ideal, but it, it's essentially a form of people power that enables people from different institutions to band together and essentially have more power together to bring about things like a living wage, for example. So I would say that would be a second possibility. I think a third possibility is connected with the work that one of my current PhD students is doing. She's working with a network that's referred to as the Poverty Truth Network. And it starts in, uh, started in Scotland, but essentially what you have, and you may well know, is a series um, in, in a city, um, a group of people from faith leaders, community leaders, and political leaders will establish what they refer to as a Poverty Truth Commission. The idea is that you, over about an 18-month period of time, bring people with lived experience, people who are living in poverty, together with people in the NGOs and the political sector who have got a responsibility within their town or city to try and develop equal conversations there. Um, we could say more about that, but that would be a third. Um, and I'm not sure that's even answered. <laughs> Let alone the gazillion others. 
So we've got two questions over on the right here. So you want to go first and then Grace? Thank you very much for your lecture. That was excellent and um, lots, of, lots of good thought. Um, I, I also have many things running around my head. One of them is was a comment that, you know, the idea of being too political, that we forget that advocating and upholding the status quo is also political. Okay. And um, the church seems to be very happy to do that a lot of the time, but thinks that advocating against the status quo is political somehow. So that was just one of the things that kind of made me think. And related to that, it, it, it seems to me that often within major churches, perhaps outside of, you know, particular urban centers, there is such class demographic in church attendance that I, I, I just see, I mean, do you, do, you, do you see this as a direct link with the disengagement that the makeup of many churches in non-urban declined areas are made up of people who don't have the direct experience and therefore a sense of disengagement drives that? or is driven by that? So that's one question, and I guess related to that, did you see quite a uniform um, acceptance of the the preferential option for the poor and liberation theology as a kind of starting point very broadly across the church leaders that you spoke to? Because obviously that's not a position that everyone necessarily would agree with, but no, you find that it was quite a broad agreement in, in your uh, that's the second, second question first um, it was certainly not universal but the, the very very clear and the, the language was slightly different so for example we had then um, Paul Butler, Bishop of Durham um, was one of the leaders that we interviewed and he was very clearly very clearly talking about God's preferential option for the poor but he did not use those exact words but he, he that's he, he he spoke about Jesus standing in solidarity with the marginalized within society which it would be a picking may not be exactly the same thing but there was a very strong commitment I think on the part of national church leaders and regional church leaders mostly within Roman Catholic, Anglican, Methodist, United Reformed, um, traditions. Um, and we saw that at national level and at regional level. We also saw it in some of the case studies so one of our case studies was of um, the response of Christians to the Grenfell Tower tragedy, the fire and the, the homelessness and issues of housing injustice and poor housing and homelessness. Um, we absolutely saw it there in, in, in writ large, in, in very, very kind of strident um, and fist-shaking notions of, on the one hand, some people talking um, about an absent God, the notion that uh, this loving God could allow 72 men, women and children to, to, to burn to death in the London borough of Kensington and Chelsea. Um, but on the other hand, there was a very strong commitment on the part of all of the local churches and in particular, Notting Hill Methodist Church, which was the one that we worked with because it was closest to the tower, to this notion of a God who was at one with, in particular, was at one with those who had died and suffered and were um, um, th th those who were oppressed. So there was a very clear, that, that was very clear there. It's also very clear in the work of Church Action on Poverty, but that's a national. Christian anti-poverty charity, as you know, one of our case studies. Um, it was less clear in interviews with evangelical church leaders and Pentecostal church leaders. And the language was much, was the, to a large degree absent in, in a number of our other case studies and where people were talking very much about social responsibility and caring and being a servant and loving our neighbor. Um, 
in practice, they were essentially living out an option for the poor, but they weren't articulating that. In terms of class, um, what we found, and one of my colleagues, um, Stephanie Denning, who's um, now, who was the postdoc on the project and is now doing a similar project on rural poverty. And what we found and what she's found is that the issue of class, in our experience, and I couldn't generalize, has been less an issue of rural versus urban and more an issue of social, of religious tradition. So it remains the case that a number of the Roman Catholic churches that we've worked alongside continue to have a large presence within working class communities. The same with black Pentecostal churches, particularly West African Pentecostal churches have got roots in, in working class communities. Um, other traditions that perhaps speak more about class solidarity felt more middle class. But then I'm pointing the finger at myself as well. Grace, and then we'll take your question. Thank you, Chris, very much. Um, I'm just going to look at these four responses that you've got. Yes, of course. Caring, campaigning and advocacy, advocacy, self help, and community building. Yes. I'm not going to say too much, but I think my main point is they should not be opposed to each other. Absolutely not. But you should look for good and bad or good and less good versions of each. Yeah. Be because it's very easy to say you, you should be campaigning, you should be going for liberation, you know. Mm. Um, well, it'll never happen, to be honest. So you better get on with your practical caring while you're doing it. <laughs> um, I mean, you look at this in Latin America, you know, the, the liberation theology comes from Latin America or, or had its first flowering in Latin America. And the Pentecostals in Latin America got impatient. Do it now. We want something now, not, you, you know, the second coming. So, you know, look for what each group you've got is good at and, and point to good practice. No, I, agree. Um, I mean, caring can be paternalistic. It can be very different. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very pleased you mentioned the self-help part because I think that often gets denigrated in the kind of discussion that we're having. And I think it is important. Oh, absolutely. Um, and I kind of had in the back of my mind that the, the parallels with the debate at the Green Institute, the ecological debate, because that, um, you know, do you plant your wildflowers now or do you, um, you know, has it got to be a hugely a kind of revolution, total, everything changes? It's got to be both. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just, rather than have a four points, well, yes, have your four points, but point of good practice in within each of them. Good practice of self-help, good practice of your voice. I'm a great admirer of Ken Leach, but you don't need too many Ken Leaches. That won't work. <laughs> you know, a prophetic voice is not a cacophony. Sure. So I, I just kind of felt, I hope as you begin to write it up, that the, the, the really fine examples of good practice and encouragement are clear. Absolutely. I mean, I, I would just say yes to most, not all, but but most of most of what you said. I think yeah. my part part company with you on, on kind of issues around liberation theology. But um, I absolutely recognise, and, and in a talk like this, it's it, it's a it's a kind of a whistle stop stop tour. I wanted to kind of reflect the different approaches that as I said, are fluid, overlap, converge, and diverge. Um, but they are the approaches that we that we recognize, that we encounter during the project. Um, and an, an illustration, and then I'll just finish before we go up to question over here. Um, I think the work of the Trussell Trust is one example of the fluidity of those traditions, because very much the Trussell Trust began in that stereotypical, inverted commas, caring response. Mm. But it's moved increasingly, as we know, much more to a campaigning slash advocacy 
approach and potentially even in some guises in some food banks in certain parts of the country there are aspects only aspects of the of the kind of community building and self-help but they're, they're hints so i there, there is a fluidity and there is a convergence but i would argue nevertheless and um, and we absolutely need to honor the importance of those, those pastoral responses to, to poverty I would argue, nevertheless, that if the churches are still serious about their calling to transform structural injustice, we need to make sure that we don't lose, lose sight of that. That has to be front and centre. Um, that's all I would add, I think, to what you were, you were saying. I, I might nuance that. That has to be front and centre. I think law has to be front and centre. And I, I, don't... I don't let one imbalance the others. Honour them all. I absolutely want to honour them all. I think what I want to do, however, for me, is to, is to return to the way that Jesus himself described his own mission, which is about challenging structural injustice and preaching good news to the poor. And so for me, it's not about anything trumping anything. And it's about the fact that we... We are working towards a vision of the gospel within which structural injustice is something that we have managed to transform in a variety of different ways. I know we're going to keep going. Like that. <laughs> um, you were talking about Castle Trust going into campaigning. It's really what I was going to say is that um, I went to Greenbelt this year for the first time for many years for all sorts of reasons. And the very first talk I went to was to hear Gordon Brown um, introduced by Trust Trust on you know, a country where poverty does not exist. Um, and how he is, is wanting to you know, lead us a, a group of faith groups and charities to campaign, I think, you know, to really put it on the political agenda more. Um, the one thing I wrote down here in my notes was that he thought that 2008-9 was a moral crisis, not a financial crisis. And I thought, Gordon Brown, but you were super involved there. <laughs> anyway. I think it was maybe both. But I yeah. think you're right. You know, what I was just going to say is, is your work linking in with that? Have you been involved with that, this campaign that they're trying to set up? Within... Sorry, which country? Trust, trust with Gordon Brown and uh, they're trying to do a sort of make, you know, make poverty history. Oh, I understand stuff. what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. Um, I've been involved in some of the conversations, but not not as closely involved as I, I'd like to be. Yeah. But we'll see. We'll see. Do you see any future for it? I mean, I'm not sure where it's going. I don't know. I think is the honest answer. I probably need to think a bit more about it. And um, it's certainly an aspiration, it has to be an aspiration, otherwise why, why are we bothering? But there needs to be more to it than that. I don't know enough about the movie. No, I, I agree with you, I don't know enough about it. And I did think it was interesting, he didn't talk about John Bird, so I did feel what John Bird is doing, yeah. and what he's working for, is, is so important on that whole thing of campaigning. No, absolutely. And then another thing I'll just say is that another role I have in Exeter is a trustee of a charity here that that began in the 1990s, very much church-led, um, and that at the moment has um, community builders in all the wards mm. in this city doing ABCD development work. Yeah. But their funding is coming to an end. Yeah. And that's the truth for other charities and things and situations, and that's the situation we're in. Um, no, no, absolutely. I think when we start having a conversation about something like this, Inevitably, there are so many kind of branches that, that, that emerge and questions and challenges that emerge. And I think kind of just where I'm sat in my particular world, I think the one thing that um, I hope I've got the opportunity to do is to use the research that we've done to help people to... <laughs> increasingly have these kinds of conversations, not just within the churches, but amongst policymakers as well. Um, and um, I'm going to write a book to make sure that it's all nuanced. <laughs> <laughs> um, any more questions? Yeah. Um, I'm going to come to you, Jane. 
Let's got another one. You can only ask one more, not a gazillion more. <laughs> <laughs> well, if anybody else has got one, who hasn't asked it? Okay. Um, so my second question is about individual versus corporate, um, because there's a very strong parallel here with carbon footprint. Uh, that BP uh, originally kind of, should we say, promoted in order to divert attention from its own uh, culpability and those of other fossil fuel companies, uh, putting all the onus on the individual to do something. Uh, so I was wondering whether um, there was something that the church could challenge in terms of that sort of um, rhetoric or you know, putting the onus on individuals for everything. It's also in the area of mental health and well-being yeah, no. um, and probably many others, but they don't spring to mind. You're right. I mean, it, it is it is very easy to wag fingers and guilt trip individuals into thinking that I'm not doing enough or it's all my fault or whatever it might be. And absolutely, because I, and I think that when we individualize, if we're challenging the notion that individualizes and moralizes poverty and kind of says it's all my fault. But then the solution to that challenge is about is only about individual act, social action. Then it doesn't seem to be quite add up. It seems to me and. So yeah, the does need... I'm talking about this whole broad thing across the range. Yeah, of I, yeah. Challenging this whole narrative. No, I, I would, I would agree with you. I mean, I, I'm not 100 percent certain what the next sentence is, though, um, because we are tied into all sorts of reasons, good, good, bad, and indifferent, kind of a, um, an, an individualized notion of. Us. Of, of, of who we are, the importance of social action, and that's all very individually, individual kind of individually centered, as it were. And consumer capitalism, in part, yes. How we get out of that as church is another matter altogether. And I knew that. You know, making millions and billions in the Bahamas. No, I, I, I think you're right. That that, that challenge, that challenge. What, what the solutions? Well, we can follow the example of the church in, in the early days in Acts. Yes. Which is completely anti church, just in one sense. Yeah. For me, it's what's in here mm -hmm. to my heart. It's not my head. It's not what I get out. It's not what I do. And that's why I think so, you know, it's taking on my cross to be the pain. Mm -hmm. I fail. <laughs> and that's why I think that in conversations about the church and poverty, 99.9% .9 of the time, we, 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 we're talking about activism and politics, and and yet we almost never, it seems to me, think about the importance of spirituality, the role that worship plays in our consciousness, if we're people of faith and our understanding of ourselves and our relationship with one another, and the kind of questions that you're talking about. Um, uh, about taking up our cross and our commitment and our response to the calling within the Gospels. Um, we forget the power as well, it seems to me. I jokingly kind of gave the example of that, or not so jokingly, and all things bright and beautiful, but we forget the power 
of worship to work on our consciousness. And part of that whole liberation struggle going back to, to Latin America before Gutierrez, the work of Freire, Paolo Freire and others, is the need to become aware, to become conscious, to wake up. And, and maybe that's part of part of the role of the church to, to, to wake us up, but it doesn't answer the question about the individual versus the collective quite. I was just thinking about singing together, we shall overcome all the songs in South Africa um, against the party. Yeah. Uh, um, the slaves in um, the United States. Yeah, sure. um, the best part of the problem of society, Western society, is individualism. It is not the way we've been brought up. We do not react community, but we're not community folks in the way, same way that other countries are. I think there are, there are sections of British society where. I would suggest that there is still a stronger focus on community than 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 others, and so. Um, but I think in, in general terms, I would absolutely yeah, absolutely. Agree. Yeah. No, no, I understand. No, I understand. No, I understand. no of course. Yeah, you see anything else? No, of course. Yeah, on there. Yeah, comes back to the one. Well, I think we um, should draw our, our conversation to a close, but not before yeah. um, um, we thanked. Um, you very, very warmly, Chris. Thank you so much for making the journey um, and giving us your expertise and um, long experience in this field. Um, you've challenged us. You've you've held up a mirror to where um, theology and the churches often are. And I think you've rightly made us feel quite uncomfortable in many ways about about that situation. But you've also you've given us some ways of looking forward, um, some structured uh, insights and um, I certainly will be um, thinking in new ways about um, this topic um, thanks to what you've shared with us today so um, can you join with me in, in thanking Chris very very warmly thank you thank you thank you very much Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I was, I was pleased with Grace push, push me. Yeah. I was pleased with you did, which is good. I'm going to see you. I wanted to do you. Thank 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 you.